So one of my most favorite task videos that I've ever seen is the any percent task of the Super Smash Bros. Brawl Subspace Emissary. Even though Brawl is one of my least favorite Smash games, its story mode is still absolutely goaded in my opinion, and is probably the most interesting Smash Bros. speedrun out there. The only problem I had when watching this task is that I didn't have any clue what was happening with all the characters flying around the screen so quickly. So that's why I made today's video, with the help of the task author Dylan Stedge, to teach you guys exactly what is going on, and instead of showing off the any percent run, today's video will be about the 100% category, which is completely different for so many reasons we'll be getting into in just a bit. I hope you're all ready to have your minds blown, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Now before we get into the super optimized Smash Bros gameplay, we should first make sure we're all using the most optimal browser out there, which of course would be today's video sponsor, Opera GX. Are you sick of your default browser wasting so many resources that it's almost impossible to play games alongside watching a simple YouTube video? Well, with GX Control, you have a lot more control over how much RAM, CPU, and bandwidth usage the browser uses, so you'll never have to make the decision between keeping a few tabs open or having a clean frame rate in game. Something that really sets Opera GX apart from the competition is how customizable the browser is with GX mods. I almost couldn't believe my eyes that there was actually a Super Smash Bros. Brawl mod already made. Opera GX also has generative AI built right into it, and I was surprised by how well it worked. You can choose from either Opera GX's built-in AI prompt reader, Aria, or use ChatGPT or ChatSonic. If you're on the fence with Opera GX because switching browsers is a hassle, I do understand, but to be honest, switching to Opera GX is about as painless as it gets, as not only can you import all settings and bookmarks from either Chrome, Internet Explorer, and Edge, but Opera GX is also compatible with all Chrome extensions. So if you'd like to make the switch, make sure to check out my link in the description or pinned comment. Thanks again to Opera GX for sponsoring this video, now let's get back to the speedrun. So for starters, what exactly constitutes a 100% completed playthrough of the Subspace Emissary? As the player progresses through the story, the completion counter in the top right of the map menu screen will gradually go up. However, there are four main things that must be done in order to reach 100% completion. Firstly, there are a bunch of these gold cubes located around the game world. These gold cubes contain items, and every single gold cube must be broken with the items collected to count towards completion. These gold cubes have varying drop chances based off the difficulty the player is on. For the 100% task, intense difficulty is used for a plethora of reasons I'll explain later on. But one benefit is that instead of a cube dropping multiple stickers that all need to be collected, they only drop a single trophy or CD instead. Another factor for 100% completion is entering every single door in the game, including the optional doors that aren't necessary for the completion of a level. The next step in 100% in the game is saving every single character turned into trophies. Normally in a 90% run, you can skip saving certain characters and only focus on freeing ones that make the speedrun faster. But for 100%, it requires exploring the entirety of subspace 1 and 2, and entering all extra rooms. The final criteria for 100% completion requires the player to beat three seeker characters after reaching the credits. This requires going back to three locations previously visited in the speedrun. The swamp, the forest, and the ruins. As for the speedrun itself, the run begins before the game is even launched. By starting from a fresh boot up with a Wii set to a specific time, it unlocks a useful plus weapon attack sticker for Peach, which increases the damage of her turnips and bob bombs. Peach's bombs are used a lot throughout the speedrun for damage boosting, so the higher the damage output, the more effective the damage boost will be. A few seconds could be saved on the run if save file creation was skipped, However, after the credits roll, it boots you out of the mode, and you have to return to a save file to kill the three seeker characters, making a save file mandatory for the 100% run. Entering the very first fight, we'll see the first instance of RNG manipulation. After selecting Mario and performing specific movement, Kirby is manipulated into using his down special. By timing this with Mario's flood, forces Kirby off the ledge, ending the fight instantly. In the next room, the player has to defeat a large wave of enemies. Peach is used here since her stitch face turnips and bob bombs are the fastest damage knockback items in the game. The only problem being these items are extremely rare to pull, so the movements you're seeing in game are specifically made to ensure Peach pulls what she needs, all while hitting enemies into other enemies and avoiding any random tripping that can occur, since it is an actual mechanic in this game. But I guess the real question here is, how does RNG manipulation in Brawl even work? Like how does Dylan even go about routing and testing for something like this? Well luckily for us, I got the man himself to hop on here to explain. So fortunately for me, the RNG function of this game was properly decompiled with the help of Eon, which means it's possible to understand how it goes from one value to the next. With an additional Lua script I made to read the game's RAM values, I'm able to predict exactly what the RNG will be at any point in time and take control of it. The function works like this. 
every time something in the game needs to call RNG, the current value is multiplied by some constant and then added to another constant. All the digits past the first eight are cut off, and this new value is used for whatever needed it. RNG is called by many things in this game, including enemies being on screen, graphical effects, item drops, and the player's own actions like running and attacking. One of the most common methods of RNG manipulation used here is dash dancing, where you can turn around and do a second dash up to six frames after you do a first one. Each dash can generate dust, which means RNG can be advanced very quickly. Taking everything into account, the RNG can be called dozens of times in a single frame if enough is happening. But thanks to the scripts I made, even if the RNG changes that much, I'm still able to know exactly when a specific item or sticker is going to be generated, or how an enemy is going to behave, which is why everything appears to go exactly as intended. In the next room, the player must defeat Petey, who is holding Peach and Zelda hostage. Kirby is chosen for this fight, as his hammers are incredibly useful, and it is actually possible to damage PD twice by hitting both him and the cage at the same time, allowing the fight to be beaten in half the time. Also, Kirby's movement is used here to manipulate PD into only swinging the cages around, avoiding his much slower jump attack. After the fight, you have the option to save either Zelda or Peach, but as you can probably guess, Peach is just so much more beneficial throughout the run due to turn up pulls and bombs, so she gets chosen. In the next level, the objective is simple. Just get to the exit as quickly as possible. Most of the time, if a character has the ability to fly, they are usually the go-to choice for the speedrun. In the next room, he finishes the initial fight as quickly as possible, using RNG manipulation to make the enemies drop bombs, then uses a final bomb drop to damage boost himself over to the first gold cube of the run, before once again grabbing another bomb from the back enemy. This is then used to boost Pit over to the final area of the room. Here we are met with Greep, a boss you normally have to fight in order to unlock the door, but here Dylan executes a pause glitch in order to skip it. Under normal circumstances, the camera in the Subsay Cemetery functionally has two modes of operation, a side-scrolling mode and a fight mode. The side-scrolling mode is used for all the standard platforming sections of Subspace, characterized by blast zones being tied to the camera, the camera always exclusively following the player, and the camera freezing when the player gets hit. In contrast, the camera's fight mode has the camera focused on the whole battle area in general, doesn't have the blast zones tied to the camera itself, and doesn't freeze when the player gets hit. By pausing on the frame a fight is supposed to start, we're able to keep the camera stuck in its side-scrolling mode, despite the fact that it should still be in fight mode. As a result, the camera remains focused on the player, and the blast zones that are normally tied to the camera don't disappear like usual. If an enemy is beyond the camera's blast zones in this case, they despawn immediately, which means with some clever movement it's possible to clear fights using the glitch without needing to attack or fight anything. In the next room, Pit's up special trick is used once again to get to the bottom platform quickly, but once here, the player has to wait for a brief auto-scrolling section. While waiting, Pit takes some damage off screen, which we'll use later in the level for increased damage boosting. Before heading to the end of the level, there is an optional door that must be entered. There's no gold cube in this room, so hypothetically you could just back out of the door and continue on. However, this specific bonus room is an upwards auto-scroller, and the camera is only unlocked once you destroy the turquoise box at the top of the room. To optimize this, Pit hits a box from under the platform to unlock the camera as quickly as possible before returning to the bottom of the room. Once out of the secret room, he makes use of his high health percentage to damage boost off the glunders and skip right over the top of a fight trigger and then lands on a launch pad, sending him straight to the final door. We'll then be heading into the next level, Sea of Clouds as Peach. The level starts out with Peach pulling three bombs to rack up damage quickly. She then pulls out a fourth bomb and drops it, and then just before it hits the ground, she pulls a fifth bomb to hold while she flies in the air to eventually use it for the remainder knockback needed to fly into the blast zone. But hold on, how is it even possible to damage boost like that? Dylan mentioned that the camera freezes when the player gets launched, so how are Pit and Peach able to fly across the level without hitting the blast zones and dying? I guess it's time for me to explain what is easily the most vital trick in the task that allows it to be as fast as it is. Indeed, the camera and blast zones freeze in place whenever the player gets knocked back in a platforming section, which leads to the intended scenario of the player dying by getting launched off the side of the now stationary screen. Keyword being intended. It turns out that the developers didn't test everything properly because there are ways to exploit this and make the camera not freeze in place. 
One way to do this is by getting hit when the camera is still in fight mode, and then launching when the camera goes back to its side-scrolling mode. This works because the player technically wasn't hit when the camera was in its side-scrolling mode, so the camera doesn't freeze. We kinda glossed over this method being used during that fight in Skyworld. But the truly broken exploit, the one that can be used almost anywhere in the game, is when you take knockback as you're moving into a wall or a ceiling. Doing this immediately puts you in an animation where you're bouncing against the thing you were moving into, and the game only freezes the camera when you're in the standard animation for taking damage. They didn't put a check in for the other animations. And so, I named this technique the Bounce Boost. And with it, it's possible to fly almost everywhere without freezing the camera at all. In the next room, the constant RNG manipulation and damage boosting continues, as Peach resumes blowing herself up across the level. Midway through, she'll take a brief stop at an optional door, which contains no gold cube, allowing her to just simply enter and exit. On the way to the exit, Peach's damage percentage actually becomes too high to be able to damage boost to the end, so Dylan manips a maximum tomato to drop from a pop band to restore a small amount of health before pulling another bomb to skip to the end. In the next room, he performs a damage boost and carefully lands Peach above the first fight with the generator. After landing, Peach grabs a stitch face and defeats the generator from above in only a few frames. Just like the last room, we'll see Peach pull a secondary bomb just before the first one lands to continue stringing damage boosts in the air. The second boost here sends Peach below to the next generator. Here there are a few enemies that you need to defeat. However, by executing a pause glitch just as Peach flies towards the generator, the camera freezes and all the enemies spawn outside of the camera's blast zones, and immediately despawn. The only enemy that doesn't despawn is the generator itself, so by quickly pulling another stitch face, she can rapidly kill the generator from above. In the next level of the jungle, Donkey Kong is chosen over Diddy Kong, as his air mobility is far superior due to the usefulness of his up special. In the first room, there is a turquoise block at the start that has a 50-50 chance of spawning either a super mushroom or a poison mushroom. Dylan manipulates this to spawn the super mushroom, and then gets a bomb off a of Goomba, and uses it to damage boost himself across the first portion of the room. While in super mushroom form, spamming rolls a bit faster than running, saving a few frames after the damage boost. After using the cannon to fire himself up to the next platform, he cancels Donkey Kong's landing lag by starting to charge up his neutral special attack, and then cancels out of it. Before ending the level, DK will do a quick stop to collect a gold cube hidden underneath some blocks, just before some damage boosting and use of the cannons to reach the exit. In the next room, he uses some fox trotting again to manip a super mushroom drop from the Skoomba. He has to pick up a trophy hidden behind a blockade, which he breaks by using down tilt to hit the trigger to break the blocks. After grabbing the trophy, he jumps up and uses a Koopa to boost himself to a secret optional door. This room contains no gold cubes, so yet again, he can just immediately exit. Afterwards, he'll use the same Koopa again to set up for a damage boost, and then get another massive boost from the red paratroopa. With all the height gained from this boost, he's able to use it to fly right over a fight trigger. On his way to the exit, it briefly appears as if Donkey Kong walks on air, However, this is just a visual glitch, as the level is only partially initialized due to the triggers being skipped. The next room is an upwards auto-scroller. So for the first part, all DK is doing is just grabbing as many stickers as he can possibly grab off enemies, as well as grabbing a required trophy on the way up. Once enough of the auto-scroller is played through, we can see some pretty funny movement here, as DK drops to a platform off-screen, taunts, gets hit by a stray hammer, and uses that damage boost to reach the next door, the same frame it loads in. In the final jungle room, Donkey Kong is falling, and has to avoid certain obstacles and enemies. Unlike Pit, DK has no way of increasing his fall speed, so there is no trick to save time here. On the way down, there's an optional door here that contains a gold cube inside, which must be broken. Then after a quick fight with some of the giant Goombas, he finishes the level. Next, we're on to the level of the planes, and we'll be starting at this level as Pit again to make use of his flying abilities. In the first area, Pit will just focus on making his way through, stacking up some damage from the nearby enemies. Once he's made his way through enough, he'll pick up a bomb off of Borboros, and then set up over by this moving wall. By positioning Pit in between the wall and ceiling just as it closes, he can throw the bomb downwards to clip and fly out of bounds and head straight to a secret door. There is a gold cube in this room, which will probably be the only time we ever see Pit use the side special which is used to clear through the boxes quickly. There's also a trophy in this room, but it's not needed, so it's ignored. 
This is because while most trophies are mandatory for 100% completion, there are a handful of trophies that do not affect your game completion percentage, such as this one. Finally, he'll send one more damage boost to get to the exit of the first room. The second and final room of the planes is a long auto-scroller, where the player encounters several fights along the way. Since Pit has such a good recovery that gives so much vertical height, it's possible to use this to cheese some of the fights. By flying as high as possible, and then using a pause glitch on the frame an enemy encounter begins, all the enemies spawn outside of the camera's blast zones and are despawned immediately. However, the final fight is skipped in a slightly different way. By reaching an X coordinate of exactly 1300, the room end trigger is activated, regardless of whether the player has completed the fight or not. By using a bomb which was grabbed during the previous fight, he boosts his way to this exact coordinate to exit the room. In the next level of the lake, Fox is selected over Diddy Kong for no specific reason other than Dylan describes him as basically superior in every way. We'll first start out with a face-off against Rayquaza. This boss is defeated quickly by mashing optimized air attacks, and RNG is manipulated in such a way to stop Rayquaza from performing any slow attacks. The rest of the level requires the player to enter a series of different rooms and hit certain triggers in order to progress. Rooms 2 through 7 are completed as fast as possible by a mixture of optimized movement as well as damage boosts. The only exception is room 4, where he has to briefly stop off to collect a gold cube, using the nearby enemies to build his damage up while collecting it. In room 8, a pause glitch is used to despawn the giant Goomba, as well as a few of the smaller Goombas. After a few quick Goomba stomps, he manages to manipulate a bomb to drop from the last one. He'll use this to both break the block that spawns, and damage boost back to the door. And then the next few rooms are traversed with the usual optimized movement. Room 12 begins as an auto-scroller, so Fox does some more sticker farming. At some point, Fox will use the side special to land in front of an optional door, and open it on the first frame it appears. After doing some perfectly timed attacks to hit the two rails into the blocks, and collecting the gold cube at the top, he heads back out. Back in the auto-scroller, he spends most of it doing specific movements and positioning enemies in such a way to manipulate the RNG to be perfect for the next room ahead. While still being at 201%, Fox jumps on a Goomba's head to drop a bomb, and he uses it to boost his way across the level into the cannon. At the damage percent he is at, he would normally fly too high to hit the cannon. However, by specifically boosting into this part of the terrain, he keeps the height under control, and he lands straight into the cannon. The level ends with a boss fight against Bowser, which is ended quickly by getting command grab suicided off the ledge. But since there's plenty of lives to spare, this still counts as a win. In the next level of the Ruined Zoo, the first room is a long auto-scroller. There's nothing to do other than manipulate one last sticker that Dylan needs, and then just wait for the auto-scroller to complete. During this time, he manages to get the player damage up to 998%, only 1% short of the game's max. This doesn't matter though, as the next room is a boss fight that gives a player a clean slate. This is a boss fight against Porky, and Dylan opts to switch from Lucas to Ness. When changing characters, it actually loses a tiny portion of time due to the RAM having to switch out information based on the character. However, the benefits from Ness's stronger damage output outweighs a minor time loss from changing characters. During the fight, Ness is able to perform a ledge cancel off the top of Porky, allowing him to repeatedly use the smash attacks in quick succession. While fighting on the ground, Ness can also mash the hell out of down tilt, which does a ton of damage quickly. For the next room, Lucas is chosen due to superior movement over Squirtle, mainly due to the movement tech called Zap Jumping. By performing a double jump as Lucas, and then immediately using a side special PK Fire, you can gain a large amount of vertical velocity. Lucas can continually use this, as well as normal damage boost shenanigans, to make his way through the level. Eventually, he will run into an encounter, but he's able to despawn most of the enemies with a pause glitch, and uses one of the remaining enemies to drop a bomb, propelling them towards the exit. In the next room, a pause glitch is used almost immediately to despawn the majority of the enemies during the fight. After finishing the fight, he collects a gold cube, and damage boosts his way to the exit. In the final room, a damage boost is used to instantly reach an optional door. After picking up the gold cube inside and returning to the main room, he uses another damage boost off the Primmons Boomerang to boost over a fight trigger. After flying around for a bit, he finishes off the level, damage boosting to the end level trigger. Following this, we'll now be playing as Marth at the Battlefield Fortress. In this room, Marth will use a bunch of damage boosting and rolling to navigate the first room. Just, 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 
which also includes entering an optional door contained in a gold cube. In the second room, he runs just far enough to spawn in one of the rotors, before running backwards and using the rotor to backboard him off the right wall to propel himself to the end of the level. Dylan now switches to Meta Knight, who is not only top tier in competitive play, but the same applies to subspace as well. Firstly, he fights off a wave of robot enemies with optimized mechanics and RNG manipulation to drop bombs, something which is already incredibly difficult to do, but especially in this fight, due to the enemies having a 77% chance not to drop any item at all. In the next room, there are a few fights you normally encounter, followed by an auto-scroller to the exit. However, by using Meta Knight's powerful recovery, by chaining up airs with jump, he's able to gain enough height to fly straight over the trigger for the first fight. By hitting the second fight's trigger, and then running back to the trigger for the first fight, it causes the camera to enter a weird state similar to the pause glitch. Then by triggering the auto-scroller, and killing the last remaining enemy from the first fight at the exact same time the camera disconnects from the auto-scroller, allows Meta Knight to boost his way over everything straight to the exit. In the next room, Meta Knight takes a brief minecart ride to hit a nearby enemy, grabs a bomb, and then boosts to an optional door. After getting inside, he takes another minecart ride over to a gold cube. After grabbing the trophy, he could damage boost back. However, this would put his damage too high for the next room's damage boost. Instead, he uses an exploit known as the Infinite Dimensional Cape. This is performed by starting Meta Knight's Dimensional Cape move and then repeatedly using Up Smash, all while simultaneously holding down on the control stick. He then manipulates some items to help him in the next fight, including some bombs, and a fully charged hot heat. This is then followed by the usual damage boosting shenanigans to quickly get to the final minecart. The next two rooms are a combination of infinite dimensional cape usage, as well as damage boosting to fly over the final fight trigger. Now entering the forest level, Yoshi is chosen simply because Dylan describes Link as very, very slow. In the first room, after using a quick pause glitch to set up for the first fight, there is an optional door, once again contained in a gold cube, that needs to be collected. Then after some damage boosting and another pause glitch, Dylan can make his way to the next room. In this room, Yoshi grabs a bomb from the trial end straight away, which is used to damage boost across a portion of the level, where he then grabs another bomb from the Aurora's to fire himself towards the next fight, and uses a sidestep dodge to hold his momentum perfectly before the fight trigger. Then a pause glitch is used to end the fight. He has to briefly wait without re-entering the fight zone to allow the fight to end. However, he can't go too far to the right, otherwise he will hit the blast zones of the actual fight area. So he is stuck above a large drop that would kill him if he fell down. Luckily using Yoshi's decent recovery, and also a hit from a primid enemy that actually isn't even supposed to have loaded in yet, he's able to last just long enough to land back on one of the fight platforms before continuing through the room. Using damage boosts, he traverses the rest of the room, including the collection of a gold cube hidden behind his blocks. In the final room, he uses a Feish attack to boost himself over the entire level, and then a Shell Pot attack to boost himself up to the top of the level. Then with an MLG egg throw, he hits a switch, and immediately uses another Feish attack to boost himself to the end of the room. Moving on to Research Facility 1, the level starts out with Zero Suit Samus, who will use a couple dash attacks to get past the first blocks. The second room is pretty straightforward, and a handful of damage boosts will be used to clear it, all while grabbing a gold cube along the way. Moving on to the third room, Samus is switched out for Pikachu due to Pikachu's quick attack cancel, which is an incredibly precise but quick form of movement executed by using his up special and angling it precisely into the ground. If done correctly, there should be relatively no end lag after landing, allowing Pikachu to repeatedly use it. This is then used to traverse through the next two rooms as quickly as possible. Once in room 5 of the research facility, the objective is to hit a red switch, which spawns a platform in the next room. In this room there is an encounter, and a gold cube. The encounter gets skipped with a pause glitch, and damage boosts are used to make way to and from the gold cube. Once Pikachu reaches the switch, it saves them time by using thunder to cheese hitting the switch from underneath. Then all that's needed is a quick manip to force the rob to drop a bomb, and damage boost all the way back to the starting door. Making way to the next room, Pikachu once again has to hit a switch, which causes a blockade to fall down. This opens up the door for moving on to the next room. But before getting to the switch, we have to wait for an auto-scroller to finish. During this time, Pikachu builds up as much damage as he can by hitting himself off the jig. Ah! 
Once at the end, he kills a Glunder and grabs a bomb off it, and uses it to hit a switch, and then performs a damage boost to go back to the original door. In the final two rooms, damage boost and quick attacks are used for optimal completion. Specifically in the last room, an insane damage boost is performed by hitting a sequence of quirk mines, skipping entirely over a fight, and sending Pikachu to the final door of the level. As we enter the next level of the Lake Shore, Yoshi is again chosen over Link. To defeat Peach the quickest, she's lured over to the left side of the screen, and then thrown right into the blast zone. The same strategy is again used in the next fight against Mario and Pit. Following these fights, Yoshi is chosen again due to having superior speed overall, and since he was already selected, no extra loading times will occur. By utilizing Yoshi's side special and a few damage boosts, he travels through this platform as quickly as possible to start an auto-scroller. As soon as the actual fight starts, he executes a pause glitch to end it almost immediately. As the platform continues lowering, he manips another bomb drop from one of the bullet bills, which he then uses at the bottom to boost to the exit. Next comes a lengthy auto-scroller where Yoshi just farms a few more stickers and collects another gold cube. In room 5, the option to switch characters is prompted again, but unsurprisingly, we'll be sticking with Yoshi for the usual reasons. His first benefit comes when making this large drop down a minecart. Yoshi's down special allows him to drop extremely quickly, which saves time over any of the other characters. This room contains two optional doors. The first door is hidden behind these blocks, but only one block has to be destroyed in order to enter. This room contains a gold cube, which is collected before leaving. For the second optional door, he has to make his way towards the end of the level and defeat the Shadus. Once defeated, the optional door appears, and Yoshi enters it. A gold cube is once again collected before leaving. After some clever movement and boosting, including a short out-of-bounds clip to save 4 seconds, he lands at the final ambush of the level. From here he executes a pause glitch, and then baits enemies from one side to the other, pushing them out of the camera's blast zones until all enemies are defeated and the exit door opens up. The final room is simple collect the gold cube, and leave. Moving on to the path to the ruins, Lucas is a faster choice yet again. In the first room he builds up a significant chunk of damage before using a bomb to launch himself over a fight trigger. Then using a damage boost from the Gagimus attack, he makes his way to an optional door. This secret room is quite different to all the others, as it contains 4 collectibles mandatory for 100% completion, all completely surrounded by breakable blocks. Once finished collecting the items and leaving the optional room, he collects a gold cube before moving on to the next room. This room is quite large, and contains a few different fights, auto-scrollers and platforming sections, as well as a gold cube to pick up. Lucas makes his way through the first three fights using a handful of different item drops, as well as pause glitches to get through them as fast as possible, and also collects a gold cube during his time. He then performs a precisely timed damage boost to fire himself over the top of the auto-scroller. While maintaining the velocity from the explosion, Lucas is able to clip into a pillar and continues being launched up to the door to exit the room. After quickly navigating through a simple room, he ends the level with a fight against Wario. This is won quickly using the same technique of luring enemies to the edge of the screen, and then just throwing them into the blast zone, which is pretty much the case for all the walk-off stages. Now entering the cave level, there are two 100% objectives in the first room. After dealing with the fight at the start, Yoshi grabs a bomb off an enemy, and then makes his way to the first of the objectives, which is a secret door. Normally you would have to wait for the giant pillar to have moved out of the way to access it, however by using the bomb to boost and a clever bonk against the wall, he's able to clip straight through the pillar and head into the door. Yoshi quickly grabs a cold cube and trophy, and then leaves. On the way out, he has to briefly wait for the pillar to get out of the way, but then does a precise clip here to save a bit of time to fall straight through the pillar again. This time he lands on the second 100% objective of the room, another gold cube. The next room afterwards is incredibly short, and if you blink you'll miss everything that happens. First he instantly collects a key needed to open the barricade blocking the door. He then hits into the flame and uses Smash Directional Influence, or SDI, to move towards the door more quickly. SDI is the ability to control the direction you get thrown when you receive damage, generally performed by mashing the analog stick in the direction you want to go. In the final room of the cave, Yoshi starts off with a damage boost to skip past the first platforming section. Next comes an encounter in which enemies only spawn after a certain amount of time. During these waiting times, more RNG manipulation is set up for the rest of the level. This process starts by first grabbing a spike ball and throwing it on the side of the stage, where the final glider spawns in at. He then also grabs a motion sensor bomb, places it, and then grabs a normal bomb. At the same time as the glider dies to the spike ball, 
He uses a motion sensor bomb to clip out of bounds, and then uses a bomb in hand for another boost. Due to the way this level is set up, it's impossible to skip over the giant Goomba fight, even from out of bounds. However, by using the trusty pause glitch, the fight is taken care of relatively quickly. Then after another damage boost and a stop off at a room containing a gold cube, Yoshi makes his way to the exit. So before loading into the next level of the ruins, you normally would have to choose between Lucas or Pokemon Trainer. However, Dylan would really much prefer to stay as Yoshi here, since he's just so much better for the level than the other two. So for the first and only time in the run, we'll get to see the use of the character storage glitch. When you're on the map screen of the Subspace Cemetery, choosing a new level for the first time almost always has a cutscene to watch, after which you either immediately play as the central character scene, or choose between a selection of characters present. But a small number of levels don't start out this way. These ones have you choose characters from a character selection screen still on the map. By having the cursor over a level that was already completed, and then moving the cursor while pressing A at the same time so the cursor is now over one of these special types of uncompleted levels, the game kind of gets confused. A difficulty selection pops up, which is only supposed to happen for completed levels, but it doesn't actually change anything here. Most crucially, continuing onward in this state loads the new level in while still using the set of characters from the last level you played. As Yoshi was just used to complete the cave, we can use this character storage glitch to continue using Yoshi in the ruins, instead of needing to choose between Lucas or the Pokemon trainer. This saves time not only because Yoshi himself is faster, but also because the game doesn't need to reload any character assets. In the first room there's a lot of waiting to be done. Firstly there's an elevator ride, followed by a minecart, and then a long fall downwards. This is another reason Yoshi is chosen, as his down special is pretty useful for these long drops. Then he'll use a bunch of boosts to make his way to the exit. There is an optional door in this room, which Dylan skips past, despite this being necessary for 100% completion. This is because the ruins is a location you have to come back to after the end credits to defeat one of the three secret characters, and it's more optimal to collect the door during the return visit. The next room starts off as an auto-scroller, during which Yoshi farms as many stickers as possible, specifically the bullfrog sticker. In just a little bit, we'll see exactly why this sticker is so strong, but for now we'll just follow Yoshi as he continues on with completing the rest of the level. In this room there's a gold cube and an optional door. It's neither faster nor slower to collect the gold cube on either visit, so he just decides to pick it up now. He also builds up a bit more damage, but only to a certain point. Because if he collects any more damage, he would have too much going into the next section. He also enters another optional door on this run through, as it cancels an auto scroller upon exit, allowing Yoshi to down special his way more quickly to the bottom. The next room begins on a moving platform where you encounter three fights along the way. Per usual, the pause glitch is used here to beat them quickly. For the second and third fight, an exploit is used with the game's buffering system, which allows Yoshi to perform two mid-air jumps without having to touch the ground to reset. This means for the second fight, he can jump incredibly high up to pause glitch a fight, and for the third fight, he can get incredibly far to the right before pause glitching while still being able to return to the platform safely. The next section of the room contains lots of switches and retracted barriers. After hitting the switch to open up the first one, he then uses a motion sensor bomb from one of the previous fights to boost himself out of bounds. The game then freaks out and places Yoshi back in bounds in an idle state, where immediately moving him makes him slide through to the next section hitting every switch quickly. Then there is a secret door to open containing a gold cube. Once collected, he returns to the main room and damage boosts himself to the door leading to the Charizard fight. This fight doesn't last too long by throwing Charizard over the edge and footstooling him down to the blast zone. At this point in the run, Dylan finally has all the stickers that he wants to apply to characters. As mentioned at the start of this video, adding stickers to characters gives them specific buffs depending on the sticker. You may remember a few minutes ago I also referenced a bullfrog sticker being extremely important. This is because with the bullfrog sticker applied, the character will spawn in with a bomb in hand at the start of every single room they enter. Dylan will then apply this to every character except Pokemon Trainer, and also adds a large collection of stickers to each character, which boosts things specific to their skill set. For example, Meta Knight gets buffs like boosted sword damage, whereas something like this wouldn't be useful at all on a character like Yoshi. Entering into the wild, Meta Knight is chosen due to the new sticker boost he now possesses. He uses the Bullfrog sticker to bomb himself immediately, and then through a series of different bomb manipulations and damage boosts, he'll make his way to a secret door. After collecting the gold cube in the secret room, and a gold cube in the main room, he then performs a damage boost into the mountain's edge. From here, he perfectly times Meta Knight's up special to clip through the mountain, landing him on the other side where the exit door lies. 
This skips the ascent over the mountain, a fight at the top, and the descent afterwards. In the next room, Meta Knight damage boosts over everything, but he then has too much damage for the rest of the level. So while waiting for this auto scroller to finish, Dylan keeps dying with every character to cycle back to Meta Knight to reset his percentage. He'll then use the remaining time to build up some more damage before the next boost. After a quick stop at a secret door, he makes his way to the next room where he collects a gold cube and boosts his way through to the end. To end the level, Meta Knight will have to face off against Gallium, but this doesn't take too long with the new sword upgrade stickers. The next level Ruined Hall is a relatively short level, only containing a single boss fight. By using Charizard, Gallium is once again defeated quickly by spamming Rock Smash, which is now ridiculously strong due to the Pokemon Trainer sticker set. Entering the Wilds 2, Dylan chooses Pit with Yoshi as a second character. After starting the level by damage boosting and flying over a fight trigger, he gets to a place where the camera freezes and he can't progress any further. This is the first time during the run where the regional version of the game matters. In any version other than PAL, dying here would send you back to the start of the level. However, for whatever reason in the PAL version, dying here just places you into the next section, allowing Dylan to carry on as Yoshi. He'll then complete a secret room, and upon exiting, he'll set up on this lift to clip through the terrain and boost to the end of the room. In the next room, he performs a precisely aimed damage boost, which allows him to quickly tech off a ledge, where he then kills an enemy and uses bomb dropped off of it to perform another boost over to the auto scroller. Then after a quick gold cube collection and damage boost, he makes his way out of the level. The Swamp is another level like the Ruins, where you'll return to it after the credits to defeat one of the three secret characters. The first collectible we come across is Gold Cube in the first room, which is collected on this run since when the level is returned to as Peach, she's incapable of reaching the cube placed here due to her fall speed. In the next room, Fox performs some quick boosting and takes out an ambush before hitting an auto-scroller. Through an auto-scroller, there is a secret door, which upon exiting cancels the auto-scroller, allowing Fox to travel to the end of it. There is also a gold cube inside the room, however due to Peach's endless bomb supply and how much distance inside the room you have to travel, it's a bit quicker to just grab this during the return. In the next room we come across a fight with Diddy Kong, which of course is won quickly by baiting him to the blast zone and throwing him right into it. Fox will spawn into the next section, boosting with these machines until he reaches a fight trigger and then uses a bomb in hand to skip over it. Then he'll just use these cannons to traverse to the end of the room. These cannons aren't able to be manipulated, so a tiny amount of time is lost to waiting for these cannons to point at the right angle. The return visit doesn't go any further than this room, so every collectible from this point forward will need to be collected now. In the next room, by using boosts and Fox's side special for optimal movement, he'll grab another gold cube and head into a secret room. The next room contains two auto scrollers separated by an ambush in the middle. For some reason this ambush can't be skipped using a pause glitch, as enemies strangely always spawn back in, so it has to be cleared through properly. Then once the auto-scroller has been progressed through far enough, a boost will be used at the end to reach the end of level trigger. We'll now be playing as Pikachu entering Research Facility 2. Pikachu starts out by making his way through the first room, hitting switches to open specific barriers. There is an optional door that must be collected, but luckily it's positioned right next to the exit door. The next room is literally just a corridor, and following it, we'll enter a fight with two Dark Samuses. Pikachu clears them both quickly by building up their damage using Thunder, and finishes them off with a bomb in hand. In the next room, there is a hidden trophy which must be collected for 100% completion. After collecting it, Pikachu builds up damage, and then uses one of the Rob's missiles to launch himself to the exit. The next room has a very complicated layout, and possesses an optional door containing a gold cube. However, the abstract layout of the room is no match for Dylan, who navigates quickly through it by using a sequence of damage boosts. Once completed, Pikachu returns to the main room and boosts the exit. In the next room, Pikachu uses a damage boost with precise velocity to clip through the ceiling into the floor above, skipping around half of the room. Here he collects a gold cube and makes his way out of the room. In the final area, Pikachu will face off against Ridley. This is made easy since his attack pattern gets manipulated in such a way that the only move he uses is sliding his tail on the stage. Using this, Pikachu is able to chain a bunch of attacks together to defeat Ridley super quickly. In the next level, Path to the Ancient Ruins, Captain Falcon will be the superior character choice. In the first room, he uses Fox Trots as his main form of movement, as this is much faster than the default running speed. There are two optional doors to collect in this room, 
The first of which contains a falling trophy, which has to be collected before it falls into the pit. Next comes a quick fight in which a pause glitch is used to end it instantly, and then a boost is used to reach the exit door. In the next room there is another large scale ambush of enemies, which he takes down quickly with the use of optimal item drops, as well as precise use of the cracker launcher. Meta Knight is then chosen for the next level, Glacial Peak, where damage boosts are used to very quickly make his way up to the top of the first room. Due to the immense amount of speed buildup, Meta Knight actually has way too much momentum and has to do a ledge grab by the final door to stop himself from flying way above it. Next comes a very long auto scroller, and Dylan uses the exact same method as a Wild's 1 to reduce his damage for the next room by cycling through all the characters to get Meta Knight back with a clean slate. Then there is also a gold cube which he collects on his way up. The next room contains two optional doors separated by a fight, which of course is skipped by using a damage boost into a pause glitch to skip the fight as fast as possible. For whatever reason, this fight is unique as the upper blast zone is partially disabled, meaning Meta Knight can boost however high he likes after pause glitching, so long as he doesn't land on any platforms to register as being too high. On the frame that the fight is over, he touches the ground and enters the second optional door to collect what he needs, and then moves on to the next room where he quickly disposes of Lucario. The next level of the cannon is pretty quick and contains another large ambush fight. By manipulating super mushrooms and explosives, as well as baiting some of the primids into jumping into the pit, this fight is taken care of with ease. Now playing as Snake, we enter into the battleship Halberd Interior. Here Dylan makes use of a movement tech called Dacus, which stands for Dash Attack Cancelled Up Smash. By cancelling the dash attack with an up smash, you can gain significant speed boost, which works extremely well with Snake. Snake will use these in the second room, followed by some boosts to quickly make his way to the falling platforms. He uses a C4 charge to hit the button to unlock a hidden door, and avoids taking damage by it due to the invincibility frames he still has from the previous damage taken. He then collects the gold cube in the secret room, and moves on boosting to the end door. Dylan will then switch over to Meta Knight due to his movement being the most useful for the rest of the level. At the start of the next room, there's no ceiling at the top, meaning it is possible to skip the whole room by clipping through it. But it can't be done in this run, as Meta Knight has to traverse through the section normally to reach a secret door containing a gold cube. But then after leaving the secret room, it is actually quicker to return to the start and skip the whole level using the gap in the ceiling. Next comes another fight against some sword permits. Dylan figured out that depending on which frame you enter the door, you get variant items provided on the ground, and by trial and error, he managed to find a frame that would give him a super mushroom, a soccer ball, and a green shell, which in conjunction clears out all the enemies super quickly. He then boosts his way through the next few rooms. Just before the ending door, he'll perform a clip to get past a bunch of barriers to access the end door. He does this by damage boosting on the perfect frame into the ceiling, and then with perfect SDI, he can position himself just slightly above the ceiling. At this point, his launch vector is above that of the retracting barriers, and he can simply fly over them to the final door. Then to finish off the level, he uses a bomb at the start to blow himself, Peach, and Zelda off the screen, before using an up special to finish them off. Moving on to the battleship Halberd Exterior, Peach is selected, and RNG manipulation is abused to pull four bombs out in a row, without having to stop moving, making for some insanely quick movement. After a brief stop for a gold cube in the second room, Peach spends the next few rooms damage boosting her way through the level. During the fight in room 4, she'll utilize a stitch face, a mushroom, and tons of explosives to take down the enemies as quickly as possible. She'll finish off a bounce boost scene using the cork mine to reach the end of the level. In the final room, she has to collect a gold cube before making her way to the exit. The gold cube is located on the ledge high up above the starting point, so it is possible to simply boost up to the platform to collect it. There is a problem, however, as the gold cube only spawns in once the camera reaches a certain height, and damage boosting causes the camera to freeze where the initial damage takes place. Doing a single jump doesn't give the camera enough height, however a double jump does. The next problem is that Dylan wants to save the double jump to make the last part of the jump easier, so we had to figure out another way around this problem. He solves this by performing a fast fall on the first possible frame, which causes the camera to lag briefly, and continues the upwards momentum, which pushes the camera just high enough to load in the cube leaving only a damage boost to be done to get up there and collect it. Peach then pulls a few bombs and boosts herself over to the exit trigger. Now that Dylan has access to Peach again, he adds the last round of stickers to Peach, Captain Falcon, and Kirby. Now with Peach at full power moving into the battleship Halbert Bridge, she takes down Duon extremely quickly. 
Moving on to the subspace bomb factory, we play as Pikachu for his fast movement options. Using the bullfrog sticker bomb given at the start of the room, Pikachu performs a precise clip to the floor to reach a secret door. After using some item RNG manipulation to quickly take down the ambush, he collects a gold cube and returns to the main room. In the next part of the room, he uses back air to hit a hidden lever, unlocking another secret door. In this room, there is a fight with two arm manks, which are disposed of quickly using the pause glitch. After unlocking a third secret door containing a gold cube, he uses damage boost to reach the final room of the level, containing a quick ambush, and uses the usual combo of pause glitching and item manipulation to complete it. Now entering the subspace bomb factory 2, Dylan chooses Captain Falcon, as Falcon Kick is incredibly useful for quick horizontal movement. Using this move combined with Fox Trots and damage boosts, he reaches the fight at the end of the first room. He manips the bomb from this fight to damage boost up to a secret door to collect another gold cube. In the next room, there are three switches that need to be hit to unlock another secret door. He navigates around to these three switches with optimized damage boosts from both bombs and enemy attacks. In the next room, there's a gold cube at the top of the level, which he grabs straight away by damage boosting up, before boosting himself towards a quick auto scroller. He begins the auto scroller without even activating the platform you're supposed to ride on. With some wall jumps and the use of frame perfect SDI, he is able to just about reach the top. He then uses a pause glitch to despawn the incoming enemies. There will be a primit that's left over since it spawns in a bit higher, but he's able to take it out with a perfectly timed up special. This results in him reaching an area he's not supposed to due to the room's collision being partially unloaded during the fight. Once the fight is completed, the invisible ceilings are removed and he is able to use this out of bounds area to reach the exit without collecting the key, which drops next to the fight. In the following room, we encounter the last large scale ambush fight of the run. With clever movement, item manipulation, and optimal item usage, the fight is breezed through quickly. Before finishing the fight, Dylan has the option to die as Captain Falcon to sub in Rob early, but it's actually quicker to stay as Captain Falcon and finish the fight as fast as possible by throwing the trophy stand at the final enemy. So at the start of the next room, Rob is just selected then. The reason Rob is selected for this room isn't necessarily because he's the most useful. Actually, it's essentially the opposite of that. This room features another Palaxos of Death Warp to skip an auto scroller. By jumping out of bounds over the left hand wall immediately upon spawning into the room, activating the auto scroller, and then dying out of bounds at just the right height, it will respawn you in an area past the auto scroller. So Rob is just used as a sacrifice to get back into Falcon. There is another auto scroller in the next room, which Dylan spent a lot of time trying to find a method to skip it. Unfortunately, so far he hasn't found a way, and we have to ride it out. The final room of this level is a boss fight against Meta Ridley. He actually takes 1.2x reduced damage from electric attacks such as Falcon's Knee. However, by utilizing the small amount of wind that's present in the room, he can edge cancel to repeatedly use his knee attack, finishing off Ridley extremely quickly. Moving on to the entrance of subspace, we are faced with a single room consisting of multiple large fights, as well as a pretty long auto scroller. Dylan selects Captain Falcon again, as it saves time due to him already being loaded into the ram. After taking care of the first fight by boosting over it and quickly killing enemies, Next comes the auto-scroller, where he first dies twice and cycles in Peach, the fastest character for the rest of the level. He defeats some enemies, and then instantly proves why Peach is the optimal character for the section. By manipulating bombs and stitch faces, and placing them in the places where the generators spawn, the fight ends almost instantly. Now in Subspace 1, all characters played so far are no longer available, as Taboo has turned them all into trophies. However, there are still three characters you can choose to play, running through the various rooms to save each member of the team. This is where the any% percent route would only save Peach, and then finish off the run. However, for 100% completion, every member must be saved. Out of the three choices, King DDD is the fastest due to a glitch known as hyperspeed waddling, where by mashing the control stick while charging King DDD's jet hammer, causes him to move incredibly quickly. In room 1, he hyperspeed waddles his way through the room, using the damage boost at the end to quickly save Samus. Room 2 initially doesn't contain anything of worth, however in the third room he needs to save Falco and Pit, as well as collect a gold cube. Upon returning to room 2, DDD uses up special and damage boost off the Trowlin to get to the next door, during which he also saves Lucas. In the following room he saves Ike, and then uses a damage boost to quickly get up to a secret door. In this room he saves a Pokemon trainer and Pikachu, using hyperspeed waddles as the fastest way of getting around the room. He then returns to the previous room, saves Donkey Kong, and uses a damage boost from the Feish to boost towards the next door, entering it as soon as it's within the camera's blast zones. In this room you are surrounded by Quark Mines, and usually have to use one of the projectile abilities to destroy them, which in this case would be DDD's Gordo Throw. 
DDD instead perfectly shields one of the cork mines, which explodes the rust, causing absolutely no damage to him. He then saves Fox and Olimar and exits the room. Now once again back in the previous room for the last time, he damage boosts from a mite's attack and saves Martha in the process, heading into the next room. Here he hyperspeed waddles and damage boosts at the end of the room, where he saves Mr. Game and Watch just before exiting. He'll next save Diddy Kong and Captain Falcon, before moving on to the next room to save the final character of Subspace 1, Mario. In the final room of Subspace 1, we face a fight against Bowser. DDD completes this with ease by inhaling Bowser while simultaneously fast falling off the edge of the stage, killing them both at the same time. Moving on to Subspace 2, Dylan switches back to Kirby. In the first room he uses damage boost from bombs and cork mines to navigate the level quickly, picks up a gold cube collectible, and saves Peach, Zelda, and Meta Knight along the way. The next room begins with a long fall downwards, during which he saves Link, Yoshi, and Lucario. At the bottom there is a fight which he manages to cheese by utilizing the pause glitch to kill the arm right as soon as it spawns in. During a short auto scroller he manipulates a green shell, which he uses alongside a pause glitch to end the fight instantly. He hovers for a moment to allow Rob's trophy to spawn in, which he then collects and moves on. In the final room he starts off by bounce boosting in a specific direction to fly across the level. He then saves the ice climbers and damage boosts towards a gold cube. Afterwards he boosts his way up to the next fight using some clever movement mechanics including the use of SDI to reach the upper platform. He waits for Snake's trophy to drop, during which the Ticken he was supposed to fight manages to fall off the edge into the abyss. He then runs over and damage boosts from the road turret attack and pause glitches just before he dies. This despawns the several Gagima you're supposed to fight, and despite dying, this is actually much faster than having to actually fight them. He then immediately starts running towards the right, which despawns the Tickens that remain, ending the fight instantly. Now all that's left to do is to collect Wario and exit the level. Finally, we'll now be entering the Great Maze, the final level of the game, with Peach selected for obvious reasons. The Great Maze, just like every other level, has a series of optional doors within some of the rooms. However, unlike the other levels, not all of these need to be entered for 100% completion. Each main room may have a selection of optional doors, and only one needs to be visited for the game to count the level as 100% completed. Despite being the 100% route, and the requirements for gold cubes and optional doors get in the way, Dylan's advanced knowledge of RNT manipulation means he actually manages to navigate the entirety of the Great Maze in a faster time than the Any% percent task. Or at least the old Any% percent task, as only a few days ago, he recently released a new one that you all should check out after watching this. Despite being the final level, navigation is relatively straightforward as Peach uses a bunch of damage boosts to surge through the whole area. At one point, she even clips through the floor in the forest section to skip re-entering certain rooms. Finally, he makes his way to the final fight against Taboo. Here we are. After over an hour of gameplay, RNG manipulation, damage boosts, and... Oh, he's already finished the fight. What can I say? Peach is pretty OP. Now all that's left to do is sit through the credits and revisit the three areas mentioned at the start of the video to complete the secret characters. The first place revisited is the forest. The secret door for this level opens up just at the location of the first fight. Peach then damage boosts, grabs a bomb, and uses a pause glitch to keep the door in range of the camera's blast zones. She then uses a bomb to boost back over to the door to enter the fight with Toon Link. Unlike all of the other boss fights in the game, these bonus fights are fought on actual brawl stages. This means that all stickers applied have no effect as we are no longer in subspace. This is no problem for Peach though, as she does a super quick flurry of frame perfect turnip throws to take down Toon Link in a matter of seconds. After the fight is over, Peach pulls two bombs at the start of the ruins. With a great level of damage buildup, she is able to super quickly navigate the first room by first corner clipping through the elevator to skip having to wait and then boost to the door. In the second room, Dylan fools around during his auto scroller, which is ended prematurely by quickly entering and exiting a secret door at the bottom. The door to the secret boss fight with Wolf is only a mere damage boost away, and the fight itself is once again taken care of within seconds. Finally, we enter the swamp. The first room is navigated by, you guessed it, more damage boosts. In the second room, Dylan made an insane discovery. He figured out that instead of pause glitching at the start of a fight to keep the camera from locking into the fight's blast zones, he found that by pause glitching as soon as you come out of a fight has a potential to skip things such as auto scrollers. This actually could be used in several other locations during the speedrun, however as you can understand, being only mere minutes from the end of this task, it wasn't really feasible for Dylan to go all the way back to add in each application, 
and instead we'll just have to wait till this task gets updated. But it's still a really cool discovery nonetheless. In this instance, he uses a reverse pause glitch to skip a long auto scroller after the fight, allowing him to simply damage boost his way up to the next door. He then collects a gold cube, which he ignored in the first swamp visit, as it is more optimal to grab it now, before returning to the previous room. Unfortunately on this occasion, he isn't coming from a fight and has to sit through the auto scroller, before entering the next room and fighting Diddy again in the same way he did on the first visit by luring him off to the left of the blast zone and pushing him into the abyss. Moving into the penultimate room of the speedrun, your damage is usually reset. However, for whatever reason on the revisit, your damage remains after the Diddy fight, meaning Dylan can do a pretty strong damage boost at the start across the level. The only problem is that his damage is now too high to skip the fight near the final door, which he has to do normally. And when I say normally, really what I mean is using a pause glitch and some item manipulation to get through it in seconds. This leaves a grand finale and final boss fight of the speedrun, Jigglypuff. And before you even have time to blink, the speedrun is over using the usual method to destroy Jigglypuff in a matter of seconds. We now see that his track percentage on the map screen is at 100% and every single secret fight is done, every optional door entered, every gold cube collected, and every character saved, thus concluding Dylan's 100% task of Super Smash Bros. Brawl, the Subspace Emissary. Anyways guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, be sure to leave a like, as it did take a ton of time to create. Special thanks again to Dylan for letting me show off this task. His channel is linked in the description, and I recommend checking it out as he just released a brand new any% percent task only a few days ago, and it's just as sick as the one you just watched. That's all for today's video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel for more speedrunning related content, and as always, I hope you all have a beautiful life.